Hello and welcome to another the Success Grid podcast with your host, Hussain Talib. I have a special guest today, Mark Willis. He's a man on a mission to help you think differently about your money and your economy and your future. Mark is a three-time number one best-selling author and the owner of Lake Growth Financial Services, and he's the host of Not Your Average Financial Podcast. Mark, welcome to The Grid. Thank you, Hussain. Glad to be on your show. Awesome, awesome to have you here. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where were you like? 10 years ago or 20 years ago and where are you now because now as i mentioned you you run financial services company like growth and you have your own podcast and you are number one listening author three times which is something that's cool <laughs> it's not easy i will tell you the secret though is uh, making great friends uh, is how you write three best-selling books uh, i was privileged to get to co-author three books with wonderful established authors uh, some of whom have been uh, New York Times bestselling authors. And so when you are co-authoring with them, you really have the opportunity to, to write on their coattails and to make some sparks fly and have some fun writing uh, wonderful content for their audience and our, our audiences grow together. So mm, cool. yeah, our, um, our financial firm here in Chicago land, we work with folks all over the United States, Canada, and around the world uh, where we meet with people one-on-one and have mm. discussions about where the world is right now. And, and, and not just on a macro level, Hussein, but on a micro and personal level. How about, you know, how about you? How about your finances? How about your family? What do you want out of life, your business? Uh, what, how do we create your own economy that's not dependent on outside forces where we can influence your future with uh, predictability and guarantees? So that's mm. what we focus on. And I get privileged to work with clients all over the world. Awesome, awesome. Because a lot of people, because a lot of things happen in the world sometimes, at the same time, they, they have a big impact on people, or this is what people think. Well, they do have some impact on them, but also people have the, they could, let's say, the initiative to, to impact their own future, like you, like you mentioned. So cool. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> speaking of your financial services, services, how can an entrepreneur, uh, like if someone wants to start a business, okay, they, and they don't have money and they want to go and boost this business, they traditionally would go to a bank or a financial services company so that they can get some money to boost their business. So do you have some ideas of someone who, can, who does not want to do that and let's say bootstrap their business? Well, the, the bootstrap model is uh, one that's, you know, certainly commendable. It sometimes can take more sweat equity and more time. Uh, and the other option is to get equity partners uh, where you have a business partner with you. I was just speaking with someone here just moments before I got on this call and he's um, been a very successful um, medical professional uh, here in the United States. And he's, he had three partners, you know, one business partner and one silent partner. And the silent partner just passed away. Just oh, you know, unfortunately that. passed away. Yeah. Uh, and so they, you know, these three people are now two, but one of the, I, I guess the surviving spouse of this, this silent partner who passed away, now she is an unwilling business partner in their mm. business. Mm. They don't cool. really, they have friendly relationship with her, but you know, they don't really, she doesn't know the first thing about a, running a medical practice. They don't really want her there, I'm sure. Uh, and so they're kind of forced in. So there's some issues. What I'm saying here is there are some issues with bringing on equity partners without having an exit strategy mm. if something like that should happen. Now, maybe it's someone passing away or maybe it's just someone deciding to leave the business. I feel like too often, many times, there's just not an exit strategy mm. for our businesses. Mm. And Hussein, um, I guess a philosophy or a belief I have is that we all need an exit strategy for whatever we're doing in our life. Because we're Mm. gonna exit everything ultimately someday uh, (laughs) in our life, hopefully a long time from now. But whether you exit your business because you sold it to a public company uh, or you went public yourself and you sold out or you pass away like this unfortunate situation, whatever your story is, someday we're gonna exit that that part of our life and we need a a well-written, thoughtful exit strategy to get us there. Mm, So um, that's one of the key I guess, topics or ideas that we think through is let's think long range. Let's think long range and build something that builds guarantees and predictability into our future. Uh, I feel like the business, the business owner 
has a lot of things in his or her life that are not guaranteed. And so if we want a success in our future, we need something that's guaranteed for us so that we can hold on to no matter what the market does or whatever the uh, business might do. Mm, yeah, cool. Because like you mentioned, uh, any business you're saying, it's like they, they should be thinking when they start out, they should be thinking about an exit strategy. Because like, for example, even naming the business itself, if you name it under your own name, when you, it's like, I don't know, it will be maybe hard to sell. <laughs> I don't know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you name it something else relative to the thing that you are actually doing, it will be maybe easier to sell and will go along the a long way in the future instead of you naming your business your own name. So that's a, a great that's idea. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's just one uh, one idea where you know you don't necessarily want it to be named after you. Um, and and I would say there's there's a number of different strategies and financial concepts that helps give you a what I call a golden parachute, where you can leave that business someday with a golden parachute on your back, and fly off into the sunset and enjoy a wonderful you know um, uh, retirement. Or, or if it's not retirement, it's the next chapter in your life mm-hmm. that gives you some sort of you know, assurance for all the risk that we take as business owners, we need some kind of walk away money um, to to leave that business better off and, and our clients or customers better off than we found them. Yeah. So you yourself and your business, how do you manage debt for your clients, for example? Is, is all debt bad or there are some good debt? Well, there there's kind of only a few ways to make major purchases. So we've been talking about bootstrapping. I'm going to call that the pay cash method. Uh, Then of course, there's going into debt to start your business or bringing on equity partners. That's really the three ways to start a business. Get into debt, pay cash and bootstrap, or bring on other outside investors. And so if we're looking at kind of the debt side of of, of this conversation, If we're using traditional banks, uh, credit cards, finance companies to finance our our business or our personal life, we are, again, we have a partner with us. Uh, And in fact, they're not just a partner, they're more like a master. Uh, (laughs) when, When we're in debt to somebody, we are literally their slave, you might say. I hate to say it that bluntly, but we have an obligation to pay them back. And if we don't, they will come and repossess our car or, you know, uh, garnish our bank account. I mean, things get pretty bad pretty quick if you don't pay your debts off. Yeah. So what can we do if we don't have, um, you know, a $10 million or whatever to start our, our dream business? Um, well, we can pay cash and we can bootstrap. Mm-hmm. And that can oftentimes take 10 years, 20 years to do. Uh, but at least we did it, you know, we pulled ourselves up by our own bootstraps as, as uh, the old phrase goes, but there is good kinds of debt. Um, and a lot of your listeners might understand the idea of good debt versus bad debt. If they've read anything by Robert Kiyosaki, like rich dad, poor dad, and other similar books, Hussein, but I'd like to actually suggest something that might kind of be a little counterintuitive. And that is what if you could become your own debt to yourself? How, what if you could be your own banker? How is that possible? <laughs> yeah. Well, it, let's think about it for a minute. If you are um, in the financial universe, if you participate in money, and most all of us do, if we're in human civilization, we're, we're in the money game, I'd like to suggest that we're already in the banking business. You know, mm-hmm. we're in our day jobs. We're, we're in two businesses, really. We're in the the job that brings in the, the paycheck every month, whether it's a W, you know, whether it's an employee job or whether it's a small business that you're starting, but we're also in the banking business. We're also in the banking business. And what, what do I mean by that? Well, there, there's a great book out there uh, written by David Graeber, and the book is called Debt the First 5,000 Years. And it goes through the history from ancient human civilization right up until today, like this moment. And, mm-hmm. and uh, he, he just talks about how banking has been a permanent part of human civilization since caveman days, you know, since as long as we've got human history. And so I'd like to, I guess, suggest to you, to you and to your audience that banking will, will be here as long as it'll outlast 
all the other major, you know, it's as old as friendship. It's as old as, you know, marriage. It's it, banking is as old as about any other human, you know, interaction with yeah. each other. So debt is permanent. The question is, who is your banker? And if you have anybody else working as your banker, they will win over the long run. They have an exit strategy for your business. If your business doesn't do well, they will take it. If it goes really well, then you have to pay them back with interest and, and you know they're going to win. So they win either way, whether your business wins or loses. And that's true on a personal level too. If you have your credit cards and your car loans and your mortgages, the bank will win. This is why banks are the biggest companies in the world. Why they yeah. have the biggest buildings in town. So what if you could pay yourself a, a monthly debt payment and recapture all that money that you're currently paying to banks, credit cards, finance companies, mortgage companies, car loan companies. If you could just pay yourself the same interest rates and monthly payments that goes currently goes to all these other banks, you would win because you'd win by default. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd win by default. Why? Because all of your competitors, everybody else in your world, whatever your business is, whether you sell, you know, widgets or tech, or you're a service company, uh, whatever you do, all of your competitors are using banks or, or really, or really your competitors are being used by banks, uh, almost like a parasite and a host. You know, the banks are leeching profits off your competitors. Yeah. So if, if you can get out of that and be your own banker, then you would win. Mm. In the competitive space between you and your competitors, you would have an advantage. Hmm. So that's how, you know, that's, that's why it's important to be your own banker. We can talk about how, but that's why it's so crucial and why as a certified financial planner, I've made it my mission to tell people that before we go chasing rates of return on Wall Street, you know, just trying to get a little bit higher rate of return or, or you know, throwing a little money into Bitcoin or something, you know, uh, that's fine. But more important than that is who is the one who controls the banking function in your life? Mm. We're already in the banking business. We're just sitting on the wrong side of the desk. Mm. So you, you're basically saying, I guess, maybe the concept of to pay yourself first, maybe, because, because if someone has a certain amount of income a month, for example, to save, this is how it's done, maybe, to save some money, like, for example, 200 300 $500 a month aside, to count it as it's like some kind of installment for something. And do not touch it for a while, put it in a place, in a bank, basically. But does not, it's like a deposit, you know, that cannot be touched for a while. Yeah, um, yeah. so pay yourself first is another really great strategy and an important philosophy. But uh, I would actually say that pay yourself first is different than bank on yourself. Mm. Uh, when you bank on yourself, you're paying yourself a loan payment with interest. So... Let's let's use uh, let's let's pretend you and I were in the mortgage business together. You and I start a mortgage company. We want to start this mortgage company. We're loaning money out to people so they can buy their homes. So for, okay, mm -hmm. so Hussein, let's let's pretend in this example that that I need a, a house and I'm going to get a mortgage for my house. Now I have a question: Would I go since you and I own this mortgage company together? Would I go to any other bank? to get my mortgage or would I come to you? <laughs> we own this company or, or are you going to take it a mortgage from another bank or will be inside uh, between us? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, if it's the same thing, but if you take it from our company, maybe you, it will be favorable to you because I will give you mm -hmm. as a partner less, uh, less fees and less uh, interest on things, right? Well, well, maybe, maybe you would. I mean, that would be very kind of you, but that wouldn't really help our business, would it? Um, yeah, and that so uh, in, will take a little bit of the business side. Yeah. In, in fact, the more fees and the more interest you charge me, the more profitable our business is, right? Mm. And I'm, I'm kind of a captive customer. You know, I'm, I'm your wonderful, I'm the best kind of customer because I can't shop anywhere else. You know, if you had a customer at your business, let's say you sold coffee, okay? Let's say you sold coffee and there was no other coffee shop in town. Couldn't you charge any price you wanted for well, coffee? Uh, yeah, basically, yes, you can. Yeah. 
So if I'm if I have to come to our company to get a mortgage, you you better at least charge me a fair interest rate. I don't want you to give me the family discount because because <laughs> I'll I'll end up you know uh, costing our our company a little bit of money, right? Now here's another question: If I stop paying you, are you going to ask me to pay you? Like not just you, but our company. Like, are you going to expect me to make a pay- a payment? Or well, well, do I get this for free? Well, well, uh, well, that might be a problem. Like you mentioned earlier, uh, <laughs> a partner, a partner passed away, so that might be a problem if you're not paying. We're cool, we're friends, but you have to pay your payments. <laughs> Good, I'm glad to Bus- hear that. Good. Business, business is business. <laughs> business comes first. I'm with, I'm, I'm with you, and I agree with you. I do the same. So here's my last question: Who am I? Who benefits from the payments I'm making? Who well, benefits from the payments I make? I guess the business itself, or eventually us both. So yeah, it's like yeah. a cy- circle. Mm-hmm. It's like a cycle, circle, yeah. Mm-hmm. So don't I, in a sort of an indirect way, don't I benefit from the payments I'm making to a mortgage company you and I own together? <laughs> well, basically, some of the money might be back to you, I guess. Yeah, yeah. A part of that would come back to me and, of course, go to you. And the point is, I'd be in control, you'd be in control, we would have control over the banking function in life. Now, multiply that out through student loans, car loans, and okay, that's a cool thought idea, but how do we actually do it, you know? Yeah. Um, so so I, I use for our clients a, a very specialized form of whole life insurance mm. that lets us act like bankers, just like I described. We use a mutual life insurance company. It's a mutually owned life insurance company. Hussein, it's kind of like if you and I mutually own a mortgage company. In this case, it happens to be a life insurance company of all things. Mm. Um, So we can use the policies that are at that company and borrow against them. So there's this, this function where we can access the money in the life insurance policy and borrow against it like a bank. Mm, it's not a real it's not a like a bank at you'd see on the street corner in town but it's like a bank and i can borrow against that life insurance Mm. and then i get to i get to repay that at any pace i wish i can choose to skip a payment or pay a hundred bucks a month or 500 bucks a month whatever i choose so i'm in control as the banker maybe maybe it's like some people who take loans based on their credit cards that's allowed in some banks i guess maybe not all or or some people who have like uh, a loan and a deposit uh, which is this one gets uh, credit interest and this one gets a debit interest so if yeah. that's higher than the other you can take a loan especially if you have like for example a one million dollar deposit box and that's giving you six percent for example a year and that's you have a loan for five percent a year so there's a one percent difference yep yep went that's right you. That's right. Yeah. And in, in fact, that's exactly what you're what you're describing. There is something called arbitrage. Uh, that's the that's the, you know, the vocabulary word there. But the key concept is powerful because you have in that in that safety deposit box or in, in my case, a whole life insurance policy. Um, it's uninterrupted compound growth, mm. which is very rare to find in the universe. You know, um, whole life insurance grows guaranteed every year compounding, becoming more valuable every year we keep it. And you're right. If I borrow against the life insurance, there's some interest that's charged, just like you'd charge me a little interest at the mortgage company that we talked about. But my policy is growing faster than any interest I'm paying on a policy loan. So there's arbitrage Mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And so I have a powerful tool and our clients have a powerful tool and use this like a bank, a bank that they own and can use it for their cars, for their vacations, for their businesses needs, you know, big, large capital expenses, maybe some inventory for their business. Uh, I've had a, had a guy just buy a, a large x-ray machine uh, for his uh, medical practice. You can use it to send your children to college. I mean, the list kind of goes on and on and on, Hussein, but the, mm-hmm. the key principle is reclaiming that banking function in our life so that we can control that part of our life rather than letting someone else control it for us. 
Yeah, yeah, cool. But just to mention a thing, I, I do, I still work in a bank, so I kind of, <laughs> but the funny thing to tell you this a little story, at the interview where they hired me, they asked me why, like, they always ask this question, why do you work here, you know? So I don't know, the day before, I read this, some quote from German philosopher, I don't know who he, who he was, but basically it said, uh, mainly like banks are not good for the world this is this is this is what was the quote around so i told him that uh, who interviewed me like i don't really believe in banks i just wanted a job right now yeah uh, <laughs> this is what this basically but the, the second and the second day they called me your hire uh, uh, so <laughs> so <laughs> that was weird Mm -hmm. but, yeah, yeah but i don't know maybe right. because i was opposite of things to them so yeah <laughs> well i'd love to i'd love to know who that philosopher was that sounds kind of interesting uh, i'll yeah, tell you uh, i will help i will check it out hopefully <laughs> well i think you're right um i think banks are the problem but banking is the solution so i'll yeah, say that again yeah. bank banks are the problem but banking personal banking on the you and me level is the solution mm -hmm. if, if if even just 10 percent of the world could have their own banking in-house, like in their family, like the Hussein Taleb family bank, yeah. you know, mm. uh, where all of a sudden now you've got the, the vast majority of the major purchases of your life are happening within the you and me level, then what would happen to the banks in this world if 10% mm, yeah. of us didn't need them? Exactly, anymore? exactly. Yes, it's, this is a great idea because in the same family, you see people who are uh, their economics are not so good some some of them are good so instead of someone who's for example not so good in the family they want to go buy a car for example and mm -hmm. they take a loan mm -hmm. from a bank why not take it from someone who's in the, inside their family and yeah may, if the if, if it's a good person to me uh, if me person if someone wants to take money from me uh, pay, pay them back as much as you took so if you took a thousand give me back a thousand i don't <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> because yep. i am mm -hmm. basically not a, I'm, uh, in general and uh, speak generally speaking i'm not a bank we're like family mm -hmm. you know give yep. it back yep. to me as much as they are but if mm -hmm. you want to make a little bit let's put put for example two percent on it <laughs> so mm -hmm. sure sure yeah. so, so so that will be inside inside of the circle that we talked about mm -hmm. instead of mm -hmm. taking that money to a bank and taking i don't know six seven eight ten percent yeah. off and you keep years paying for it i love it well hussein and, and you get to decide as the banker what you charge if anything i'll tell you two very quick stories um uh, one is a, just a just an average client of mine wonderful wonderful man he's a photographer <laughs> so he doesn't make a you know a million bucks a year doing his uh, photography business and he started one of these whole life policies we call them bank on yourself type whole life policies so one of these bank on yourself type whole life policies, he started them at just a couple hundred bucks a month mm. and he started saving in it and he started borrowing from that to cover his uh, film and photography equipment rather than using a credit card and paying some other bank. He's now using that money in his policy and banking on himself. That's the mm. idea. But mm. here's where things get interesting because he's showing off his new camera and, and his competitors, his colleague photographers are saying, Hey, you know, you know, where'd you get that? How'd you buy that? And he says, Oh, I used my bank. I used my personal bank to buy this. And they're like, your personal bank, what are you talking about? And he's, and, and then, and then they say, well, Hey, I could, I need to borrow some money for my new camera. So he's now bank. He's the bank for others as well. His competitors are coming to him. His <laughs> photographer competitors are coming to him for money. So like I said before, you're already in the banking business. You're just sitting on the wrong side of the desk. Mm, he moved yeah. to the right side of the desk. He's now the banker for himself, but mm. he's also helping other people get their photography equipment. And even though they might be his competitors, they are paying him for those you know, new lenses and cameras and everything else. Yeah. That's just one story. And I'll share just one other very quick story. There was a gentleman who um, had some health issues and he could not own, he could not be the insured because life insurance requires a medical exam here in the United mm. States, um, probably most places. And so he had an open heart surgery and could not get a policy on himself, but he got a policy on his wife and his three adult children and all of his grandchildren. So he's got like 12 policies that he owns all of all together. 
and he is the owner of those policies. He controls the policies. And about once a year, he gets the whole family together at Thanksgiving and, you know, he'll have a, a conversation with them about what all the policies are doing. He'll say, hey, hey, family, here's the family bank. You know, here's the 12 policies we all have. Uh, and if you need any money, kids, don't go to the bank down the street, come to the family bank. Uh, and, you know, we'll get you that car loan. We'll, we'll pay off your student loans. And guess what? When they pay him back, who are they benefiting? Well, the family. Yeah. You know, someday when he passes away, that's money that they get to inherit again. And guess what? Dude. They're going to go put that into new policies. Yeah. And so the cycle continues. This is how generational wealth is created. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, so we're talking about here, like a lot of people have big problems dealing with fi their own finances. Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, so how, how any, anyone like the average Joe or anyone can improve their finances and without taking the risks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you know, again, if you control the environment where your money lives, you have, un, you have removed unnecessary risk. Uh, if someone else controls the environment where your money lives, there's going to be unnecessary risk. And, you know, Hussein, you know, this, um, starting a business, heck, just walking out the door, getting in your car or whatever, that takes risk just to, to go outside these days, especially. <laughs> uh, so, so I don't want to avoid risk in the risk is the potential for reward. Mm. Um, mm. Now, risk and reward are not the same thing. I think in, in the United States, especially, we've become a nation of speculators and we think that the, the that risk equals reward, and that is not true. <laughs> risk is the possibility of loss. That's what mm. risk means. Um, so if we want to take risk, we have to realize that we potentially could lose. So I don't want to take unnecessary risk. That's kind of my personal philosophy. I don't want to take unnecessary risk. I'm happy with risk. I'm a business owner too. And I love the thrill of like going on a zip line or, you know, taking a, a, a water boat ski, whatever outside, but unnecessary risk is something we stop doing after college. You know, uh, <laughs> once you, uh, once you start starting a business, you don't want unnecessary risks in your business. Yeah. Exactly. So how can you do it? You can control the environment where your money lives. I'll tell you that banks, and I hate to hate, hate to be a hater on banks since you work <laughs> at one, but, um, a bank will tell you what to do with your money and then they'll go and do something completely different. I'll tell you a statistic. According to the FDIC Insurance, which is a, a corporation here in the United States, um, Chase uh, Bank of America has $22 billion in cash value life insurance. $22 billion in cash value life insurance. Some of these bank on yourself type policies I'm describing is life insurance. So they have $22 billion in life cash value in life insurance. That is worth more to them. It's valued higher than all of their bank branches, all their real estate, and their downtown Manhattan, New York City building combined. Whoa. Uh, so they've got, what are they doing with so much cash value life insurance? Uh, and it's part of their tier one capital. Okay, okay, that's that's just Bank of America. Talk mm. about Chase Bank and Wells Fargo mm. and Citibank. All the, Citibank, yeah. I've got a full list of all the major banks and how much money. It's hundreds of billions of dollars in cash value life insurance. So my question is, um, why do banks tell us to put money in savings accounts and CDs and money market accounts? And then with their own money, they go put money into life insurance. What do they know that we don't? And so my my philosophy is don't do what banks tell you to do with your money watch what they go do with their money and then do that instead <laughs> well, that, that's good that's powerful but what watch what happened in in the real estate market i guess in the states which affected the global market in 2008 and the banks i i watched the, the movie the big short like a while back and yeah. <laughs> it's when you when you when you are that situation like the movie when you bet against the market that's going to go down which is was the real estate market which is most people say like it's not, it's a market that won't be down let's say so 
some people yeah know know certain things and profit from the people who are putting money like in the movie the, some people who lost their pensions and 401k and these kind of things so basically always the money transferring to people who are who has the money already mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah well you're right i think um somebody once said I, I need to go find out who wrote this but they said if you took all the money in the world and then spread it out evenly to every person if everyone got the exact same amount of money they said that within about 30 years or so it would all be bundled up again among kind of the the top 10 percent and then the other 90 percent um i don't know if that's true or not but that makes sense you know that makes sense <laughs> yeah. because some some people are willing to um to lose their money uh for today they would rather spend there's a quote by gloria steinem she says rich people plan for four generations and poor people plan for Saturday night. And I think that's, that's how we lose wealth. Uh, that's why the, the rich get richer and why the poor get poorer. Part of the reason why, maybe not the whole reason, but I think in some, it's at least a part of the reason is we have short-term thinkers and we have long-term thinkers. Mm -hmm. And Hussein, I, I think the people who listen to your podcast are wanting a better future. That's why they're listening to a podcast and not, you know, just listening to music or whatever all the time. They're trying to be a better version of themselves. They, the show is called the success grid for goodness sakes. So you're, you're wanting a better, bigger future. And that's awesome. So, you know, if you have, if you have a, um, a, a, an audience that's wanting a better, bigger future, then they're going to be a part of that smaller group of people that think long range, yeah, you know, exactly. not just for Saturday night. Yeah, well, that's like we mentioned earlier. It's like people, they, they, as soon as they get their money, they want to spend it. Uh, they want to hang out. They want to mm -hmm. watch a movie. These kind of things. Uh, and that's cool. That's okay. But um, mm -hmm. if, you're, if someone looks at themselves like 10 years or 15 or 20 years from now, if they are like 20 or 30, so that would be the same thing again and again and again. You need mm -hmm. to 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 do better than that, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> if, yeah. Uh, unless your mindset is like uh, you're good where you are, that's something different, and that that's the problem. Some people are, let's say, comfortable with where they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And I'm I'm not here to tell folks how to live. That's not my. You know, some people are um, mosquitoes, and some people are grasshoppers. Uh, you know, there's, there's mosquitoes that fly to the bug zapper and, and just go out in a blaze of glory, you know, zap and they're gone, you know, uh, and that's a wonderful, beautiful spark of, of, of brilliance for about a split second. And the others are the grasshoppers that are chump, chomping on grass as boring as it looks, but they live for years and years and years. And, uh, you know, they, they reproduce. So, you know, I, I really hope that, um, whatever little bit of insight folks get from this show it's to think long range mm -hmm. i had a i had a tree fall in my yard uh, we had some big storms this last week here Ooh. and uh so i had a a arborist a tree guy come out uh and talk to me about what to do with this tree and he's he's one of those guys who's saying who just he he loves what he does and you can tell he loves trees he was like holding the tree you know almost <laughs> like giving it a nice hug <laughs> He was showing me these little spots and here's the little mushroom that you need to watch out for. But um, what one thing he really emphasized was he looked at me, he kind of saw what, how old I was. He kind of saw my daughter playing in the back and he's like, you know, you're Mark, you're probably going to be here a long time. You might have grandkids here. We need to do this, 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 and this to help get you ready for the next 50 years. And these trees are going to be here for the next hundred years. And so he helped me think long range. And I think a good financial advisor they're not just trying to chase this week's rate of return. Mm, you yeah. know, they're not, they're not just chasing this week's headlines. They're mm. wanting you to think long range. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, like with our work we do with clients, I don't just think about the taxes that you're going to pay this year. Mm, cool. But I think so, about how much you're going to pay over your lifetime in taxes and even your kids. And mm. how can we minimize that so that <sighs> you can keep more of the hard work you've, you've um, set out to, to keep. Mm, cool. So, you personally speaking of taxes and these kind of things and like 50 years ahead. So how do you personally uh, work with your clients to make them, for example, do certain investments or certain things to be wealthier with time 
And what the second question is would be like, what are the things that uh, would make them pay less taxes? Because <laughs> paying less taxes, we, a lot of talk about people who are wealthier, like Jeff Bezos, Bezos yes. and other people who are mm -hmm. like billions of dollars talking about like they pay less taxes. So, <laughs> so yeah. how do you mm -hmm. do that? Is that possible? Yeah. Warren Buffett, Jeff Bezos, uh, Elon Musk, um, you know, the uh, Carl Icahn, there was a recent, um, there was a recent publication uh, in the news cycle here um, by ProPublica, which is an independent news report agency. They investigate, I guess they found the IRS, someone at the Treasury Department leaked, uh, <laughs> illegally leaked uh, all these people's uh, tax returns, all these very wealthy you know, public member, uh, public uh, individuals' tax returns. I mean, imagine if that was your, you know, tax return. Uh, so he here in the United States, it's illegal to kind of share that information publicly. But he here it is; it's public. It's on. It's in the world for all of us to see. And you're right. Jeff Bezos spent. He has a number of years where he paid no taxes. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, who started Facebook, multiple years where he paid no taxes. And they use. It's very interesting. I read the report. I dug into the details. And they very similarly use all the legal means they can to pay no taxes, both now and in the future. But they had to buy in to this club. Mm. They had to buy their ticket. They paid a lot of taxes. You know, Mark Zuckerberg in 2013, he paid over $1 billion in taxes in that year alone, wow. uh, the report says. So here's something that I'll share. It's called the buy, borrow, die strategy. Mm -hmm. Buy, borrow, die. Mm -hmm. So B-U-Y. Okay. And then B O double R O W and then D I E. So it's buy, borrow, die. Does that make sense so far? <laughs> but uh, I think one of the strategies, like maybe like some countries, I guess they make some people open businesses without taxes. So this is might be one of them. Just mm -hmm. just a note. I think this is what yeah. I, yeah. Well, mm. the business itself might pay no taxes, but how do individuals like live your life? So so anytime there's and every country is gonna have a different um you know, tax law, but I noticed these are the same around the world. So the first step in the buy, borrow, die strategy is to buy assets that don't pay you an income. Mm. So it has to be that because um, if you get paid an income, like let's say you get a rental property, yeah, uh, very popular for folks to want to do real estate investing. But if you get a asset like a rental property and it starts paying you rent, you have to eventually you have to pay taxes on that on that rent. Yeah. Now here in the United States, there's things like depreciation costs and some other strategies to lower your taxes, but that's a taxable stream of income. That rent money will eventually become taxable to you. Yeah. Um, so we have to find assets that don't pay income. This is why Warren Buffett um, and his company Berkshire Hathaway has not paid a dividend uh, since 1965. There's they, a reason why. They you know? don't dividend, you mean dividend to the to the shareholders, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Really? In, yeah, yeah, look it yeah. up. Uh, so there's no income that comes when you own a share of Berkshire Hathaway, they don't pay a dividend. As profitable as they are, they are intentionally not paying dividends, I think, because Warren Buffett would have paid billions of dollars in taxes over these many years um, if they had been paying dividends to him and all the shares of stock he owns. So... That's the first step is to buy an asset. And this is straight out of uh, the ProPublica report, buy assets that you don't see an income on. Mm. Uh, and this might relate back to our bank on yourself strategy I mentioned earlier. So hold tight with me. Uh, the second step in the buy, borrow, die is to borrow. So if you borrow against that asset that you just bought, like Mark, Mark Zuckerberg uh, in 2013, he paid that billion dollars of taxes. What did he do? He bought a bunch of shares of Facebook and he bought in, he, he paid his ticket to be a part of the super wealthy. And now he borrows against his Facebook shares to live. Cause you know, if you just buy a bunch of, you know, assets, how are you gonna buy your groceries? How are you gonna buy your yacht, your second yacht, you know, <laughs> uh, your luxurious lifestyle. So you gotta borrow against all of this, all these assets. And Hussein, the interesting thing is when you get a loan, it's not considered income. Mm. And therefore, it's, it's not taxable. It's it's a liability, an economic liability. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, so if it's not a income, it's a liability, and so you never have to pay a tax on a debt, and so they're able to live on their 
their borrowed money. This is how Donald Trump did it. You know, he, he has a ton of debt because he lives on all that money and he has all these real estate deals. Um, so it's all the super wealthy. They all do the same thing. It's all completely legal. But the key is the gotcha that most tax systems have is when you die, you're supposed to pay a big estate tax. Uh, and so dying is an interesting uh, tax avoidance strategy for the uber wealthy. And what they do is they, they actually have either a trust or they have uh, other means to have a what's called a step up in basis where all your assets become more valuable when you die. Here in the United States, if I bought, if I bought a house for a hundred grand, hundred thousand dollars, and then let's say it grows to a million dollars over my lifetime, and then I die and leave it to my children, it would be worth 1 million to them and they would not have to pay a tax. Uh, so that's, that's the last step in the buy, borrow, die strategy. Now, mm. uh, first of all, I, I want to kind of talk about how us normal people could do this, but do you have any questions over the buy, yeah, borrow, it's, die? It's, it's like <clears throat> they're basically using debt or borrowing to, to go around things because like we mentioned, for example, taking a loan is basically a liability. So it can be taxed on that. Or mm -hmm. like you mentioned, an asset that does not bring any income. So <laughs> what the, what, the, uh, and you mentioned real estate, like real estate brings, brings your rent and you have to pay for that. But what are their assets that does not bring income? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, shares of stock that are not paying a dividend. That would be one. Like Warren um, Buffett. Yeah. Yeah. What, like Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. Yep. Artwork, uh, gold, um, uh, things that don't produce an income. Um, life insurance is an interesting one. So this is where like average folks like you and me, uh, I can buy a life insurance policy. It's an asset. You know, if it's term insurance, term insurance is just a death benefit. And that's not really, you can't use the buy, borrow, die strategy with term insurance. Most people think about life insurance and they think about term insurance. Hmm. term insurance is just the money you leave your family if you die you're just hmm. renting you're just renting life insurance which is fine you know just like renting an apartment there's nothing wrong with renting an apartment but if you're going to own a house you're going to eventually start to build up an asset it's called equity uh, in the house right your equity hmm. in the house is the amount of the house that you own as you pay down your mortgage that's kind of how you own the house and with whole life insurance, this bank on yourself designed whole life insurance, you're building an asset that does not produce income. In fact, mm. there's a lot of really cool pieces here that I'll just skip right over. But mm. just imagine you've got this building guaranteed to grow for you asset. For the rest of your life, it grows guaranteed according to the insurance company, Hussein. Mm. Not even Mark Zuckerberg's stock is guaranteed to grow. You know, Facebook can go down. In <laughs> fact, it has. Uh, so with these whole life policies that consistently and continually grow guaranteed, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's but, great. but it doesn't pay an income. Mm. Well, that's very devil like, I guess it's not like small, yeah. it's like a devil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and then, and then as I, as I mentioned earlier, you can borrow against life insurance. We talked about how you could bank on yourself and become your own source of financing for your cars. But just like that, you can buy, borrow, die with life insurance. You can mm -hmm. borrow against the asset and it's all tax free when you borrow against life insurance. And then when you pass away, you avoid the um, income tax because that death benefit is income tax free here in the United States. The death benefit, which might be a million bucks, 10 million bucks, you know, whatever your death benefit is, it's all left to the family tax free. So it's oh, a great way mm -hmm. for folks to try out buy, borrow, die before they become the next Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, you see these big guys that they they move very fast like from elon musk from i guess paypal he started and then he sold and then he went to tesla i think and the, i i think i read that he didn't found tesla he bought brought this bought tesla hmm. right hmm. so yeah yeah so he did not really find tesla hmm. and uh and then now he's basically into space <laughs> so yeah. and now with richard branson into space and bezos into space they, they are going really uh, at track speed, uh, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these are yeah. Yeah, uh, really cool yeah. tips uh, we can you can you share here right now. So uh, what would you say uh, one takeaway from this episode? Well, if if, if I could just say one thing, uh, banking is already in your life. Uh, from even if you pay cash for things, 
you're still in the banking business. If you paid cash and had no debt, uh, I'd feel sorry for you because you'd be stealing from your future when you pay cash for things. Um, think of it this way, you know, at least when you're borrowing from someone else's bank, you know, at least you're an honest banker with who you have a debt to. But when you pay cash for something, you're stealing from your future. Mm -hmm. If I paid $30,000 for a car, you know, I would think, okay, I've, I've, I've spent $30,000. But the reality here, Hussein, is I lost 30 grand and whatever that $30,000 might have grown to had I not bought the car. Yeah, exactly. Because especially the car is an asset that is going to depreciate. The moment you yeah. buy it, it's going to be 25000 <laughs> Yes, that's right. That's right. And let's say my $30,000, let's say my $30,000 had been left alone. And let's say I, I, I just rode in your car for the rest of my life. And, and uh, <laughs> you, let me, you let me ride in, those, in the passenger seat my entire life. What would $30,000 grow to over my lifetime if I could keep it invested at let's say 5% a year, I'm doing the math here for the next, I'll just say the next 60 years. Oh. What would $30,000 grow to? Do you want 60, to know? Do you... I don't know, maybe 50 million. <laughs> <laughs> well, not quite, but you're in the right ballpark. $560,000 for one car. Oh, okay. you know? So <laughs> when I pay $30,000 for a car today, I'm losing over my lifetime $560,000, I would rather finance that car with my bank on yourself policy, borrow mm. from myself and keep that compound growth happening. So my takeaway from the episode today is bank on yourself. Don't pay cash and don't use a, another person's bank, even worse, um, to, to finance your major purchases. Uh, you mm. can control the banking function in your life. Cool, awesome. So Mark, where can people get in touch with you? If you'd like to hear more about this, you can go to my podcast. It's not your average financial podcast.com. That's not your average financial podcast.com. If you want to meet up with me and have a conversation with me, I'd be happy to meet with you. You can request a meeting by going to bit.ly slash learn B O Y. That's bit.ly slash learn B O Y. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for being here today with me on this episode of the Success Secret Podcast. My pleasure. Thank you.